This is going to be the next lesson for the Bible Institute. The last study on Abraham, we saw the formulation of the nation of Israel. And I went back and looked at my notes and I misspoke and called it the calling out of the nation of Israel. But I messed up. It was the formulation of the nation of Israel. And we talked about last time how Israel ends up in Egypt and they end up in Egypt under the cruel bondage of Pharaoh. And Deuteronomy 4.20 calls Egypt the iron furnace. It calls it a house of bondage. And Israel being in Egypt is a picture of us being in this cruel, evil world. And so Israel's back there in Egypt. And they're going to cry out to God for help. And he's going to send them a deliverer, which is Moses. And now we're going to see the calling out of the nation of Israel. In Genesis, you saw Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, and Jacob's 12 sons, and that was the formulation of the nation of Israel. Now we're going to see in Exodus the calling out of the nation of Israel. And if you can get... <clears throat> Israel in your mind, it's going to help you understand the Old Testament. So God's going to call them out of Egypt as a nation in the book of Exodus. And you're going to find that when you read the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all four of those books are, all four of those books are going to cover around the same period of time. And... <clears throat> There's some great things that happen in these uh, books. One of them, the Passover. i got to point out to you the Passover. What you have in Exodus 7 through 11 is the Lord brings the plagues on Pharaoh in Egypt. And they picture the same plagues that he's going to bring in the tribulation. If you look at them, you know, the plague of locusts, the plague of darkness. You, know, you have the swarms of flies, the plague of boils. And if you go through there and read about them plagues, you can line them up with plagues that happen in the tribulation. And then you got Moses and Aaron, and they're going to picture the two witnesses. And even beyond that, Moses is one of the two witnesses that comes back in Revelation chapter 11. And then Pharaoh pictures the Antichrist. So the Lord brings the plagues in Exodus 7 through 11. And he says, against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. He went against all the gods of Egypt with those plagues. And after the Lord brings the plagues on Pharaoh in Egypt, he brings one last final blow to Pharaoh, and this will be the death of the firstborn in the house of every Egyptian. And that's Exodus chapter 12 when this happens. The Lord instructs Moses to have all of Israel ready because they're about to leave Egypt. And he tells them to take a lamb, kill it, shed its blood, put it on the side posts and the upper door posts of their house. And that's, this is Exodus 12. He tells them to take a lamb, then he calls it the lamb, then he calls it your lamb. And that's the order of how it goes. At first you, you just see Jesus as a God. Then somebody shows you that he's the lamb, the only one that can save you. And then you take him as your lamb, a lamb, the lamb, your lamb. And that's what you see in Exodus 12. And you'll notice in Exodus 12, it never says lambs. It always says lamb because there's only one. Just like Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Just like John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. So the Lord instructs Moses to have all Israel ready because they're about to leave Egypt. He tells them to get that lamb, kill it, shed its blood. All Israel had to shed its blood, picturing Israel killing the Lord Jesus Christ, shedding his blood. And the Lord says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So they apply the blood to the doorposts and the side posts, anybody who had the blood applied was safe from the wrath 
of the destroyer as he came by. And this picture is how me and you are safe from the wrath of God through the blood of the Lamb, of Je the Lamb Jesus Christ. After God slays all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, the Egyptians are ready for Israel to leave, to hit the road. So what happens next? Israel begins their journey to the promised land. Jacob came into Egypt with around 66 people. And now they're leaving Egypt 400 or so years later with 600,000 men. And if you add women and children to that, you most likely have around 200, I mean 2 million people most likely that's leaving Egypt. He came in with 66, leaving with around 2 million. And then you get eventually get to Exodus chapter 20, and the Lord gives Moses the law in John 1.17. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Exodus chapter 20, he gives Moses the law, and in John 1.17, it has this great verse showing you this great division. It says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Notice that. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. This makes a few very clear marks in your Bible. Think about it. For the law was given by Moses, Moses didn't give it, didn't get it till Exodus 20. Showing you that before that, that wasn't the time of the law. Then when Jesus Christ showed up, uh, you got another transition there. So it, se it seems like during the time of the Lord's earthly ministry, it goes into a, a whole other new dispensation. So what you've got is at least three clear divisions given just from that one verse. So to say that there's no dispensations is just not being honest, not honest Bible study at all. Now what you have during the Lord's earthly ministry, you know, they're still under the law, but it's a transition period. They're transitioning into the New Testament, so you got different things going on. So that makes a very clear mark in your Bible. John 1, 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So this shows that something definitely changed in God's dealing with Israel in Exodus 20. And this is where we get into the Mosaic Covenant. So here's some details about this covenant. The main characters you're going to see is Moses, Aaron, and Joshua. The covenant is the Mosaic Covenant. And now what's the purpose of this covenant? Well, because of the disobedience of Israel as a nation, God had to bring in the Mosaic Law to keep them in check. Read Ezekiel 20, 8 through 11. And Galatians 3.19. Galatians 3.19 says it was added because of transgressions. That's why God brought the law. It was added because of transgressions. Another thing is it was our, it's our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It's your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. And that's Galatians 3.24 it says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. But here, the faith that we have today hadn't came yet. Back here with Moses and the book of Exodus and Numbers, Deuteronomy. So that was the purpose of the covenant. Because of the disobedience of the nation of Israel, it was added because of transgressions, and it was our schoolmaster. The purpose of it was to be our schoolmaster. What's the token of this covenant? Well, the token or the sign or the symbol of this covenant is the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a sign to Israel. And if you look at Exodus 31, 
Exodus 31, 16. It says, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. He says in Exodus 31, 17, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses, when he made an end of communing with him, upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So the, so the sign, or token, is the Sabbath. You might could even say those two tables of stone as well. And then Christ seen as, in this, in this covenant, the prophet like unto Moses. You compare Moses' life to the Lord Jesus, you're going to find so many similarities between Jesus Christ and Moses. Jesus is called the prophet like unto Moses. Another thing, you got Joshua. Joshua, Moses' minister, his, his, I guess you could call him his prodigy, the guy that's going to take over after him. Joshua pictures the Lord Jesus. And whereas Moses doesn't get Israel into the promised land, Joshua gets them into the promised land. Moses, who brings the law, Moses could picture the law, which can't get you where you need to be with God. And then Joshua pictures Jesus Christ who gets you into the promised land. You see there, you see the picture. Moses picturing the law, Joshua pictured, picturing Jesus Christ. Moses doesn't get them in the promised land, Joshua does. So that's where you see the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> in this. Okay, now the dispensation. That was looking at the covenant, now we're looking at the dispensation. And the dispensations are connected with the covenants. It's, I think it's better to look at the Bible through the covenants more than the dispensations. But it's also good to look at the dispensations as well. The dispensation is a dispensation of the law. The steward is Moses. His kingship has to do with the fact that he's referred to to the king of Jeshurun in Deuteronomy 33.5. Jeshurun. J-E-S-H-U-R-U-N. Jeshurun. He's referred to as a, the king of Jeshurun in Deuteronomy 33.5. <clears throat> and, you know, Israel hadn't got into having a king yet, but Moses is called a king. And that's what the Bible's about. It's about kings and kingdoms. It's about who's running the show. Back there with Adam, he was given a crown. The Bible says he was crowned with glory and honor. And he was given dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, as it talks about in Genesis 128. And being the husband, the first man, he was the head. Then you get to Noah, and Noah was given dominion uh, when he he was as the head of his house over his wife, and him being the oldest over his his sons. They got off that ark. He was the king. Then you got to Abraham as the father of the the nation of Israel. He was the king. So now you got Moses. And Moses is referred to the king of Jeshurun. And that's what the Bible is about, kings and kingdoms. It's about who's running the show. Now, the responsibility during this dispensation, what was their responsibility? The responsibility is they had to abide by the law and offer the sacrifices when they broke it. Nobody was eternally saved by keeping the law. Now, Bible believers get accused of, of teaching that a lot. What they say is that we're saying that they got eternal salvation and they're going to spend eternity with the Lord because they kept the law. And they'll even teach that we teach that they kept it perfectly without breaking it. 
But actually, nobody kept the law perfectly. What you wanted was to keep it as good as you could and then offer the prescribed sacrifice when you broke it. Just like today, you know, you get saved and you're supposed to want to live as close to the Lord Jesus as you possibly can and go as long without sinning as you possibly can. But what happens? We end up sinning. But then we confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not for salvation because we're already saved, but for fellowship, for a, a daily cleansing of this flesh. We confess our sins for fellowship. We're already saved. That's taken care of. Our sins are already paid for, past, present, and future. But as a fellowship thing, we confess our sins daily. And then, you know, we get confessed up. And when it comes to our, our flesh, our daily walk, we can be blameless. And that's the way it was with the law. You wanted to keep it as good as you could, offer the prescribed sacrifice when you broke it, and then you would be, according to the law, blameless. Not because they kept it perfectly, not because they always did everything right, not because they were sinless, but because they did what was required of them, their responsibility. Keep it as good as you could, then offer the prescribed sacrifice when you broke it. And there are people that were, according to the law, blameless. There are people that God looked at them and said they were blameless concerning the law. For example, Paul himself said in Philippians that he was, according to the law, blameless before he was saved, before he was, when he was a Pharisee. In, in Luke 1, 5, and 6, it says, There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. You see, they were counted righteous before God because they walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Did that mean they were sinless? No, nobody's sinless. Nobody kept the law perfectly. But they, what they did was they kept the law as good as they could and then they would have offered the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it and been according to the law blameless. And they were counted righteous because of their walk. Now, me and you, we're not righteous because of our walk. We're righteous because we got the righteousness of Jesus Christ on our record. They didn't have that. We do. Now, you can live righteously, but you're never going to live righteously enough to get the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He had to give that to you. And that's why you get to have eternal security. That's why you have eternal security. That's why you're going to spend forever with the Lord. Not because you walk righteously. And nobody is sinless or perfect. Nobody ever kept the law perfectly. But when you, but when they tried their best and then offered the prescribed sacrifice when they failed, they made things right, they were considered blameless. And obviously keeping the law to the best of their ability and offering animal sacrifices when they broke it, that could never get them eternal salvation. But it did, however, keep them in good standing with God to the point that it got them to the comfort side of the heart of the earth when they died. And I know that there's a lot of people, I mean, not a lot of people, but there's some, quite a few guys out there now saying that in the Old Testament that they did not go to the heart of the earth at death. I mean, that's, that's becoming a popular thing now for people to say that. But you read Luke, Luke 16, that settles it for me. It looks very clear that in Luke 16, you got Abraham and Lazarus on one side, you got the rich man in hell on the other side. It, it talks about Lazarus. He, he, he died and they, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. It says the rich man also died and was buried and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments. There was a great gulf fixed between them. He looked over, saw Abraham. He told him to send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool his tongue because he's tormented in this flame. So that's clear to me. I don't think that's, that was just a one-time event. 
like some people say, they say that was just a one-time event where, where God allowed them to to just see each other one time. I think that that's the way it was before the resurrection, that the people in hell could look over and see them. They could look over and see the rich man. And I don't profess to understand everything about that, but that's exactly what it looks like when you read Luke 16. Luke 16 was not a parable. It was actual... It had They had names. The event actually took place. So saying the Old Testament saints were, as people say, saved the same way as we are today is wrong because... Jesus Christ hadn't died on the cross yet. He hadn't shed his blood for our sins yet. So how could they have the same salvation? That's why I have the salvation I have today is because Jesus Christ has already died on the cross. Jesus Christ has already shed his blood. He's already been buried and resurrected. They didn't have that yet. He hadn't done that yet. The perfect sacrifice had not been made yet. That's why they needed the temporal bloody animal sacrifices that at best pictured, it pictured at best the ultimate sacrifice for sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. But they couldn't have had the blood of Jesus Christ applied to their soul yet because it hadn't been shed yet. And if, if you're saying that they had the same salvation as we have, then you would have to say that they had a blood applied to them and you the blood of Jesus applied to them and if they had the blood of Jesus applied to their soul back then, then you're saying that the Lord went ahead and applied it to them before it even happened. And just because God sees through his foreknowledge that he's going to die for the sins of the whole world, that doesn't mean he went ahead and applied the blood to the Old Testament saints. Just like Think about your salvation today. God knew that when you were a young child that one day you were going to believe the gospel and be saved. But did he go ahead and save you back then when you were a young child or did when you were a baby or did he save you the moment you believed? He knew you were going to get saved. He knew you were going to get the blood applied, but did he apply it to you before or after you believed. So, what you have in the Old Testament is, under the law, they needed to keep the law as good as they could, offer their prescribed sacrifice when they broke it. This kept them in good standing with God, and that got them to paradise in the heart of the earth. But it would never be good enough to get them, you know, eternal security, eternal salvation, and with the Lord for eternity. It was never good enough to do that. They needed the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the blood hadn't been shed yet, and they did not have the benefits that me and you have. You know, me and you have eternal security. Me and you are born again into the family of God. Me and you have the sealing of the Holy Spirit. We're sealed into the day of redemption. They didn't have the sealing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit could come and go. Just like with King Saul, he lost the Holy Spirit, never got it back. You take Samson, he had the Holy Spirit, he lost it, and then he got it back again. And then you got David, who, who knew he could have lost it, but he didn't lose it. And he even prayed in Psalm 51, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now, me and you aren't going to pray that today. We're sealed into the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit ain't going to leave us. We got the spiritual circumcision. God cut our soul loose from our flesh. They didn't have the spiritual circumcision that we have in Colossians 2.11. So we got our, the salvation, if you want to call it their salvation, is not, it's not the same. And that's where the confusion comes from is the word saved and salvation. When you say that they were saved and had salvation, and that puts people in mind of what we have today. 
and they just did not have what we have today. So, they had to go to the comfort side of the heart of the earth when they died back then. And that's laid out very clearly in Luke 16 with the rich man and Lazarus. Then, when Jesus Christ died on the cross and resurrected, he took the Old Testament saints with him up to the third heaven. So, ultimately, the Old Testament saints, they got to the third heaven with the Lord by the blood of Jesus. But that isn't what got them to paradise in the heart of the earth. That's the way you can look at it. Their own righteousness kept them in good standing with God and to the heart of the earth. But that their own righteousness never got them eternal salvation. So, that's the way you can look at it right there. So now, what, what's the, in, in this dispensation, what's the test? Well, man failed by living, living by his conscience. You know, we had the dispensation of conscience. They failed. Man just living by his conscience didn't work. Now, now the test is, how will man do when God tells him exactly what needs to be done in writing? I mean, they had it wrote down what exactly what needed to be done. Now, how will they do with that? That's the test. Okay, what's the failures? They had it wrote down and everything. What was the failure? They broke the law. They broke the commandments written on those tables of stone. What's another failure? They taught for doctrine the commandments of men. They had the clear commandments of God written out. And what to do when you broke those commandments, they had that wrote out. But instead, they still taught for doctrine the commandments of men. Number three, you have, when you get into the Gospels, you'll see the corrupt groups such as the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. You'll see they corrupted the law, and they began teaching for doctrine the commandments of men, and they overruled the law by their tradition. They took their tradition over the law. So you had the, the, those corrupt groups that came up. Number four, they rejected not only the written words of God, but also the word in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that in the Gospels. And then number five, they killed the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that was the failures. Now what's the result of these failures? Israel didn't get the kingdoms that the Lord offered them in the Gospels and in the, at the beginning of the book of Acts. He was offering them both kingdoms. They rejected him. They killed him. The result, they didn't get the kingdoms. What's the judgment? The judgment is they're struck with intense spiritual blindness until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That's Romans 11.25. He says, for I would not have you to be ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So that right now, is you see, Israel, since Israel rejected the Lord Jesus, they're blind in part. For the most part, the Jews are blind to the gospel. They don't believe Jesus Christ is God. They don't believe he can save them. But it's just a temporary thing. But that was the judgment. They're struck with blindness, complete blindness. When it comes to the gospel, they don't get it. <clears throat> What's the length of time? The length of time of this dispensation. Well, the beginning of this dispensation would be at Mount Sinai with Moses on Mount Sinai. The ending would be at the death of the Lord Jesus. So you got about Exodus 20 to Matthew 26. It's a long, long part of your Bible right there. And it's a, that's around 1,500 years around that. And But see, pay attention to this. The law starts up again after the rapture. And runs through the millennium. And that's why when you get to Matthew 24, 20, when Jesus is talking about the end times, 
He said, Play, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now, what would that matter about the Sabbath day if the law hadn't come back? You remember the Sabbath is a sign to Israel. That was the token of the Mosaic Covenant. If that Mosaic law isn't coming back in the tribulation time period, then what would, what would it matter if their flight was on the Sabbath day? Remember, Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 2, let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of the holy days or the new moons or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. You see, the Sabbath don't have nothing to do with the body of Christ. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. We don't have to keep the Sabbath as the body of Christ. But Israel does. In the tribulation, they'll be back doing that again. So, right now, we're not under the law. We're under grace. But the law comes back again after the rapture, after we leave here. And this is because after the rapture, the body of Christ leaves, God goes back to dealing with the Jews. And that's why you have it called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is Israel. Jacob had his name changed to Israel back there in the book of Genesis. So, and like I said, this goes, it starts with Moses at Mount Sinai, ends with the death of Jesus Christ. But, Note this, note this down. The law was still in effect during the days of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. But what you have, it's almost like a, a dispensation within one in Jesus Christ's earthly ministry because it's going through a transition phase. And you could even separate that off as a, as a, a separate dispensation and call it the days of Jesus' earthly ministry. Because during that time, it's transitioning into the New Testament. You see, you can't just cut it off at, at, at certain points and say, okay, that's the end of it. Because they'd go through transitions. And that's what you got with the Gospels. In the Gospels, you're transitioning from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You get to the book of Acts, you're transitioning from the Jews to the church. So there's not just clear cutoff points you got to take in mind those, those transitions. And remember that verse in John 1, 17, the law was given by Moses, but grace, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So what you have, you got the law given by Moses. They're still under the law during Jesus' earthly ministry, but he's bringing in that grace and truth. It's transitioning into that. So you got transitions you got to take into account. And that's why... You don't go, we don't go to, to Matthew, to the Gospels, to get our clear doctrine out of. I'm not saying you can't get doctrine out of them for you today, but when I want doctrine for me today, the most clear place for me to go get my doctrine is not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's in the Pauline epistles that's written directly to us today, the church. I'm not going to go to Revelation to get my main doctrine today i'm not saying i can't because it's in there too but that's that's for the primarily for the tri tribulation you see you don't go to the book of, where does all the cults go to get their doctrine the book of acts you know why because it's unclear what's going on because it's going through a transition going from the jews to the church they're still being offered the kingdom in the early part of the book of acts the jews are so, okay, note number two. There will be differences when the law is in operation again during the tribulation time period because it's after Jesus Christ died on the cross. So it's not going to be exactly the same as it was the first time they were under the law. For example, Revelation 14, 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, in the Old Testament, they had no idea of the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not know that he was going to die on the cross for their sins and be buried and resurrected. They, had, they did not know that. And <clears throat> while there were pictures and types of it, 
just like Abraham offering Isaac, things like that. Just because there was pictures and types doesn't mean that they understood those things. Because the disciples themselves did not even understand the gospel when they had it preached to them. They said that Jesus preached to them to the gospel, talked about his death, burial, and resurrection, that it was going to happen. And it said they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them. If the disciples who walked and talked with Jesus didn't understand the clear gospel, the Old Testament saints who were here before Jesus even showed up in the flesh, they didn't understand it either. Okay, so that is a quick little outline of the, the Mosaic Covenant and the dispensation of the law. And we looked at the Passover. Now we're going to talk about Israel wandering. And another great scene in the Old Testament, Israel wandering. And did you know that it was only an 11-day journey to get where Israel needed to be? It was only an 11-day journey. But it ended up taking them 40 years because of their disobedience when they when they when they would have crossed over to go into the promised land they sent spies to spy out the people of the land and it turns out the devil see what the devil did what he, see he he's he's so mad about that promised seed in genesis three fifteen, and all you see him attacking that promised seed over and over and over he does not want that promised seed to be born and what he does is when Israel is out of the land, he has that thing populated with evil, wicked men. And it turns out that the devil put a bunch of giants over there to scare them out of going into possessing the land. And that's a picture of your Christian life. If there's something God wants you to do, the devil will have a giant over there to scare you out of doing it. So when they were down in Egypt all that time, the devil was compiling a civilization of giants to put fear in Israel to scare them out of going and taking the land. He didn't want anyone coming in to take that land because he believed that it was his. Because back there in that original creation, that land is where Lucifer's throne was. That's why he does not want Israel having that land. So he got those sons of God to come down again, most likely, and it produced giants again. Just like back there in Genesis 6 when he tried to corrupt the seed back there. So the consequences of not going right in to possess the land is that the Lord would have them wander for 40 years. It went from 11 days journey to 40 years until all the people who was afraid to go in and possess the land. During that 40 years those people died off and then their children would go in to possess the land 40 years later. But Deuteronomy 1-2 tells you there are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir into Kadesh Barnea. It was just 11 days journey. And it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according unto all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. In Deuteronomy, what you have is the second giving of the law. And he, it tells you right, it told you right there that it was 11 days journey. It ended up being 40 years. And then the next great event, you got Israel crossing Jordan. After the death of Aaron, after the death, death of Moses, and the older generation of Israel died off, Joshua and the newer generation would cross over Jordan and go in to possess the promised land. This land is the promised land because it is the one promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, their descendants, and when they get into the promised land, they have to fight some battles. That's what the book of Joshua is all about. The promised land does not picture heaven. Going into the promised land pictures the victorious Christian life. Joshua gets you, gets you into the promised land. Jesus got you salvation. But after salvation, you're fighting battles down here. Joshua, when he, when he goes into the to take it, He's fighting battles. And at the end of the book of jo Joshua, they've conquered most of the land, but there's still some nations left that they've not conquered because God wanted those nations to stay around to prove, to test the nation of Israel. 
And then you get after the book of Joshua, you get into the time when the judges ruled. You see, before Israel had the kings reigning on thrones, the Lord gave them judges. And what happened was Israel would get off into wickedness and the Lord would have to deliver them into the hand of an enemy. And when they were del delivered into the hand of an enemy, they would cry out to God and God would be moved with compassion towards them and then send them a deliverer. Those deliverers were the judges. So that's what you got in the book of Judges. You got all these, these judges it talks about. Men like Samson, men like Gideon, men like uh, Deborah, men like Shamgar. This will put you in the book of Judges. The book of Ruth also takes place during this time. Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, read that. It shows you that it took place when the judges ruled. And this is a time where men were doing what was right in their own eyes. And Samuel, you know Samuel, First and Second Samuel? Samuel is the last judge that Israel has. Israel wanted a king, so they end up with King Saul. They told Samuel, they're like, we want a king. You're old. You're getting old. We, we need us a king to fight our battles. So they end up with King Saul. Saul isn't who God wanted. He was the people's choice. But this is where we, when you get into 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, this is where you get into the days of the kings of Israel and Judah, another great part of your Bible, the days of the kings of Israel and Judah. Now with King Saul, King David, and King Solomon, all of Israel is united under those kings. And But then, after Solomon, you get to Rehoboam, that's where there's a split the kingdom is divided. The ten northern tribes make up the king, kingdom of Israel. And, and then the other two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, make up the kingdom of Judah. But the days of the kings of Israel and Judah will take you through 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. And let me just lay out for you real quick 1st and 2nd Samuel through 1st and 2nd Chronicles. What you have in 1 Samuel is the story of the prophet Samuel. But you also have King Saul's reign and the beginning of the story of David. That's 1 Samuel. You got Samuel, Saul, and David. You get into 2 Samuel, you got the story of David continued. You'll, you'll see it's mostly his troubles, his troubles and trials because of what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah. And then you're going to see his troubles with his children. You know, he, his baby's going to die. You're going to see his troubles with Amnon, his troubles with Absalom. But then you get into 1 Kings, David dies, and you got the reign of David's son Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. And the splitting of the kingdom under Rehoboam and Jeroboam happens in 1 Kings. You got the two southern tribes going with Rehoboam, the ten northern tribes going with Jeroboam. So it's not like it was with Saul and David and Solomon where the Israel's united under one king. It's a split kingdom. Then in 2 Kings, it covers many of the different kings of Israel and Judah with the primary focus on the northern kingdom, which is the kingdom of Israel. And that was the most wicked of the two. They, their kings were idolaters, extremely wicked then you get into first chronicles and you get into first chronicles and what you got in first chronicles is it's mainly going back over the life of david again then you get into second chronicles and it covers many different kings in second chronicles as second kings did however this time the focus is on the southern kingdom whereas the second whereas second kings focused on the northern kingdom it's going back over the same kings as you saw in 2 Kings with the focus on the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. And if you can get that in your mind and laid out what those six books are about, that's a good chunk of your Old Testament right there. You get that wrote down, get that in your mind, that's a good chunk right there. And then you can just go through those books, read them and study them, put all the little kinks together with that. So while the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his sons in the book of Genesis showed us the formulation of the nation of Israel, 
Exodus showed us the calling out of the nation of Israel. Now with the book of the Kings and even a little bit of Joshua, you can see where God is establishing the nation of Israel. You see, in Joshua, they were going in, conquering over all these nations. And then you got David finishing off the conquering of those nations. That's the establishment of the nation of Israel and the, the kingdom of heaven. So Israel saw after a king that they could see with their eyes so that he could go out and fight their battles. God wanted to reign as divine king over their heart and set them up as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See Exodus 19.6. And in 1 Samuel 8.5, they said they wanted Samuel to make them a king to judge like all the nations. So God gave them their king, and he turned out to be a real jerk, King Saul, back there in 1 Samuel. And King Saul is the first king of Israel. He was not God's choice. He is a picture of the Antichrist. And then you have King David coming in after him. That was God's choice. He's a true warrior. He pictures Jesus Christ coming back at the second coming after the reign of the Antichrist. King Saul pictures the Antichrist. And then you got King David showing up, a true warrior, picturing the Lord Jesus Christ coming back at the second coming, where he's going to make war and righteousness. Then, after King David, you got King Solomon, the reign of King Solomon. King Solomon is also a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And since Solomon has peace on every side during his reign, because the David just finished conquering the remaining enemies, Solomon's reign pictures the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, which happens to be, the millennial reign happens to be after the second coming. So what you have with King Saul, King David, and King Solomon is a picture of the premillennial return of the Lord within the story of those first three kings. You got, Day, you got King Saul picturing the Antichrist. You got King David coming after him. He pictures the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Then you got King Solomon coming after him, picturing Jesus Christ during the millennial reign. The Bible is an amazing book. It lays it out for you so clearly. So you have King David, the greatest king Israel ever had. All the kings you'll see will be compared to David. And none of them are ever come out to be as good as he did now remember he is called a man after god's own heart all the kings will be compared to him and the life of david is covered in first and second samuel and first chronicles and he wrote most of the psalms so that's where that book comes in and david wiped out the last of the enemy nations that were left David is one of the greatest pictures of the Lord Jesus in the Bible, and he pictures Jesus Christ coming back to fight at the second coming because he's a warrior. He's a warrior king. Uh, this brings us to another covenant as well, the Davidic covenant. We just looked at the Mosaic covenant. Now let's look at the Davidic covenant. And under this covenant, you're still in the dispensation of the law. But there is something different going on under this covenant. So who's the main character of this one? David. What's the covenant called? The Davidic covenant. What about his kingship? Well, David is the greatest king Israel ever had. And he's also going to sit on the throne in the millennium as well. What's the purpose of this covenant? Well, number one... They needed to build a temple and establish a kingdom. And you read about that in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 13. Also, number two, what's the purpose of the covenant is so the mercy of God couldn't depart from David. He had something called the sure mercies of David. You see that in 2 Samuel 7, 14 through 15 and in Isaiah 55, 3. He had the sure mercies of David. And that has to do with David committed a murder and adultery. He, he saw a woman named Bathsheba bathing, and he lusted after her, and he took her. She was another man's wife. So he took her, 
and he ends up, she ends up being with child, and to cover up the sin, he tries different things to cover up the sin, but then eventually murders her husband by putting him at the front lines of the hottest battle. So he committed murder and adultery. And both of those, with both of those sins, you should have been put to death under the law. However, because of the sure mercies of David, he had something that the other Old Testament saints didn't have. And it says in 2 Samuel 12, 13, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. That's the sure mercies of David. And that pictures what me and you have. It's not the same thing as what me and you have. You need to get that straight. It's not the same, but it's a picture. Because the Lord has put away our sin as well. And in Psalm 51, 11, it shows you that David knew he could have lost the Holy Spirit. He said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. This shows you that there was a completely different system going on in the Old Testament than there is today. Because today, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit sealed you unto the day of redemption. There's no way it can be taken away from you. Now, what David had is a picture of what you got. But he didn't have what you have. Or he wouldn't have said in Psalm 51, 11, Take not the Holy Spirit from me. Now another purpose of this covenant, To make the throne of David continue forever, David gets a literal throne in the millennial kingdom. So the throne of David is going to continue forever. In Luke 1, 32-33, Talking about the Lord, it says, He shall be great, and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Okay, what's the token of this covenant? It's a throne. It says in Second Samuel 7.16. And thine house and thine, thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So the token or sign or symbol of this covenant is a throne. Now, how do you see the Lord Jesus Christ? Christ is seen as the promised seed that will sit on David's throne. In 2 Samuel seven twelve, it says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Jesus is that promised seed that will sit on David's throne. In Luke 1, 31 through 32, it says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So that, this is the Davidic covenant. And then you have David's son, Solomon. And Solomon started out great. He's actually the son of David and Bathsheba. Bathsheba, the one the woman that he pretty much stole from one of his mighty men, Uriah. But they have a son named Solomon, and he starts out great. The Lord blesses him with riches. He blesses him with wisdom. And from him, you get the wisdom books. You get Proverbs. You get Song of Solomon. You get Ecclesiastes from Solomon. He wrote three of the greatest books, most quoted books in the Bible. And those are the wisdom books. You see how your Bible just lines up together with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? With Genesis, you had the formulation of Israel. And Exodus, you had the calling out of the nation of Israel. And Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy cover about the same 40-year time period. Then you get into Joshua, where... They're going into the promised land to take it over, and they're fighting battles. And then you got judges. When the judges ruled, 
and every man's doing that which was right in his own eyes and you got Ruth that's during the time when the judges ruled then you got first and second Samuel getting into David you got first and second Kings talking about uh, Solomon and the other kings that come after him and then you got first and second chronicles that go over um, the same stuff but add more a little bit different detail and <clears throat> and then the wisdom books they come from the, some of these kings david he writes the psalms solomon writing proverbs song of solomon ecclesiastes and you got Job. Job would have taken place back there around the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, somewhere in there. Because you can tell by reading it that it was before the law. So you can see how your your Bible's really coming together when you look at it this way. And in the in first and second Kings, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. You've got the establishment of the nation of Israel. David's wiped out the last uh, enemies. Solomon has peace. The kingdom is established. And <clears throat> things are going pretty good with Solomon. And that's where those great wisdom books come in. Solomon had peace on every side. He's another great type of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Solomon pictures Jesus Christ during the millennium where he has peace peace on every side and david reigned for 40 years and then solomon reigned for 40 years that was the greatest peak for israel but at the close of solomon you start to see the demise of the nation of israel so in genesis with abraham You've got the formulation of the nation of Israel with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his 12 sons. The formulation. In Exodus, you've got the calling out of the nation of Israel. You get into 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. You've got the establishment of the nation of Israel. And then after Solomon, or at the close of Solomon, he gets into this all this idolatry because his wives take away his heart, and you've got the demise of the nation of Israel. So, David reigned for 40 years, and then Solomon reigned for 40 years. That was the greatest peak for Israel. After that, you begin to see their demise. Later on in Solomon's reign, he begins a down he'll slide. He begins to intermarry with women of other nations, and these women turn away his heart after other gods, and the nation of Israel begins to go downhill very quickly. When Solomon's son Rehoboam takes the throne, he really messes things up, and instead of listening to the wisdom of the old men, instead of getting out them wisdom books, Proverbs was basically Solomon writing to Rehoboam. That's why he says, my son. It was Solomon writing to him. Instead of getting them wisdom books out and, and taking heed to those wisdom books, he listens to the young men that came up with him, and he ends up splitting the kingdom in half. He splits the kingdom of Israel in half. You see, David and Saul and Solomon, when they were king, Israel was united under them. When Rehoboam takes it, he splits it. He has the biggest church split that ever was. Ten of those 12 tribes choose to have Jeroboam as their king. And they will be referred to as the kingdom of Israel and the northern tribes. While Judah and Benjamin will have Rehoboam as their king, they will be referred to as the kingdom of Judah or the southern tribes. And that's what you see for the rest of First and Second Kings and and in Second Chronicles, that's what you see, is the split kingdom. And the same way all the kings are compared to David, they are also many times compared to Jeroboam. Many times you'll see phrases like this in Second Kings fourteen three, where it says, "And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David his father." All the kings are compared to David. But many times you'll see a phrase like this in 2 Kings 13, 2, where it says, And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. 
You see, David and Jeroboam are the opposite extremes. David was extremely good. I mean, he wasn't perfect, as we talked about earlier, but uh, they were the opposite end of extremes. David was extremely good. Jeroboam was extremely wicked. Jeroboam made his own false religion to combat true worship of God, and this caused Israel to start off on the wrong foot, and they never got to where they needed to be. They got worse and worse. And while the kingdom of Judah would have end up having some great kings, they too end up following the sins of Jeroboam time and time again themselves. You have 19 kings in the northern kingdom. You got 19 in the southern kingdom. And there are some great ones, but most of them are very wicked, and none of them can match up with David. So during the reigns of the kings of Israel and Judah, the Lord sends prophets to preach against their wickedness and idolatry. And you'll see men like Elijah. You'll see men like Elisha. And you know all those, those prophets at the end of your Old Testament? Are you familiar with the major and minor prophets? Well, most of those prophets were prophesying during the reign of of all these wicked kings. They were trying to turn the hearts of the king and the people back to the Lord. So even though those prophets are chronologically in the back of your Old Testament, most of them are taking place during the reigns of these kings of Israel and Judah. So once you get to like Second Chronicles 36, you're getting close to the, to the end of the story of the Old Testament. Because th those prophets are taking place during the reigns of these kings. Like Isaiah. Like Jeremiah. I mean, you go to the... Just look at Jeremiah chapter 1. Or Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 1. And Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. You see that? Isaiah was prophesying during the reigns of the kings of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. You see that? How even though Isaiah comes later on in your Bible, that doesn't mean it's happening way later. It's actually taking place during the reigns of the kings that you see in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. You see what I mean? And then you look at somebody like Hosea. Go all the way over to Hosea in your Bible. Hosea 1.1. 1, 1. It says, The word of the Lord came unto Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And in the days of Jeroboam, uh, the, Jeroboam the second, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So you see how these kings, they're, they're taking place during the reign. These prophets are taking place during the reign of these kings. And then you see uh, Amos 1.1, 1, 1, the words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So you see what I mean? Just These are just some examples, some examples here of when these prophets were actually prophesying. They were prophesying during the days of the kings of Israel and Judah. And what they were doing was trying to get people back to God. They're trying to get people to turn back to God from their idolatry. And that's why when you get in these prophets, they're tell, pretty much just so doom and gloom, telling people to turn back to God, talking about their idolatry, their high places and things like that. And they're trying to turn the hearts of the kings and the people back to the Lord. So even though these prophets are chronologically in the end of your Old Testament, most of them are taking place during the reigns of the kings of Israel and Judah. Very rarely did they completely and, and truly hearken to the words of the prophets. <coughs> so you see the slow demise of the nation of Israel, starting with King Solomon going after those, those 
gods and idolatry because of his wives. From there, you see the demise. They get so wicked and the cup of God's wrath gets full and they end up being carried away captive. Both of them. The southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin, which is called the kingdom of Judah, and the northern kingdom, which is called the kingdom of Israel, which, which is the ten tribes. They both get carried away captive eventually. In 721 B.C., the northern kingdom, kingdom of Israel, is taken over by Assyria. You read about that in 2 Kings 17 through 18. They're taken over by Assyria in 721 B.C. They're taken captive. Then, later on, in 606 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar comes through and takes the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. And you read about that, 2 Chronicles 36, 2 Kings 25. At this point, the kingdom of heaven is gone. The Lord puts away, divorces Israel, and they are still put away today until one day they will be restored. And in Psalm 78, 58, it says, For they provoked him to anger with their high places. The high places is where they'd go to worship and sacrifice to false gods and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men. You see, the tabernacle no longer worked at this point. They would just be going through the motions when it came to, to the tabernacle. And it says in Psalm 78, 61, and delivered his strength into captivity. Israel was his strength. He delivered them into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. He gave his people over also unto the sword and was wroth with his inheritance. He put away Israel temporarily. And right now what you've got going on today is that Israel is blind in part. They are, when they see the Old Testament, they're blind to that. They're blind to the Lord Jesus. They don't recognize Jesus Christ as the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh. And in Romans eleven twenty five, it says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. That's how you know it's not talking about the church. We're already saved. But Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. I'm not Jacob. I'm not Israel. That's talking about the physical nation of Israel. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. That's not talking about me. My sins are already taken away. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. That's not talking about me and you. That's not talking about the church. We're not enemies to the gospel. But the unbelieving nation of Israel is. They are enemies to the gospel. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They do not believe Jesus Christ can save you. So they're enemies in that sense. But as touching the election, they're beloved for the Father's sakes. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, had those. they're the fathers. They had those promises given to them. The 12 tribes have those promises given to them. So touching the election, they're beloved for the Father's sakes. That's your balanced view on the nation of Israel. Concerning the gospel, they're, they're wicked. They're, they're teaching doctrine of Antichrist. So concerning the gospel, they're enemies. But touching the election, that, that makes them our beloved enemies. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Right now, they're put on the shelf. They're put away. But then, one day, all Israel shall be saved. And it ain't. And see, the uh, replacement theology guys want to 
get this all twisted and say that we're teaching that oh, you're, they're saved just because they're a Jew and a Jew doesn't have to believe on Jesus to be saved. That's a lie. The, the, uh, if a Jew does not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to hell. But those promises that were given to Abraham don't go away. You see, there's going to be a believing remnant in the tribulation of Jews. They're going to go into the kingdom and get the land. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to be in the millennial kingdom. They're going to have the land. We're, it's not, we're not saying that, you know, unbelieving Jews who deny Jesus Christ and are wicked are going to go in and get the land. They're going to go to hell. But there's going to be a believing remnant. And you got all those, you got all those uh, Old Testament saints, the Jews, that are saints, and they're going to go into the kingdom. They're going to have the land, and that's Israel. They're not. You see, the Old Testament Jews, they're not part of the body of Christ. They're not part of the church, which is his body. And they're going to be in the millennial kingdom, and they're going to get the land promised to them. And us, the church, we're going to be in glorified bodies, and we're also going to get reign over cities and and then all throughout eternity the jew is gonna and is gonna get the earth and it ain't it's so it's not that unbelieving jews are gonna get to inherit the earth even just because they're jews no they're going to hell but you have believing ones you have believing ones from the old testament you're gonna have believing ones and the tribulation, you're going to have believing ones that are born in the millennium. They're going to get it. They're going to get the land. Of course, the Jews in the Old Testament that were that did not believe on the Lord, they're in hell. The ones from today that die, they're in hell. They're not coming back to get the land. The ones that deny the Lord in the tribulation, they're in hell. They're not going to get it. The ones that choose satan in the at the end of the millennium they're going to go to hell too the lake of fire so it's not it's not unbelieving jews that are getting anything this is talking about the nation of israel so all israel shall be saved as it is written there shall come out of zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from jacob and if a jew gets saved today he gets put into the body of Christ, the church, where there's neither Jew nor Gentile. So you see there, you can't mix the church and Israel. That doesn't work. Right now, God's not dealing with Israel. He's dealing with us, the church. And when you get put into the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ. But after the church leaves, the body of Christ leaves in the rapture, the tribulation's going to happen, and part of that's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is Israel. That time goes back to God dealing with Israel. That's why you see that crazy stuff going on, the supernatural stuff going on, because the Jews require a sign. But this has been the Mosaic Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, and the Dispensation of the Law.